Every day, citizens around the country are faced with new dilemmas. Dilemmas that affect them profoundly. Whether it's injustice, discrimination, falling through the cracks, scandal and cronyism, balances of power, ethics, religious freedom, state versus citizens and unfunded mandates, and the list goes on and on and on. Welcome to Speak Up is directed at those who have fallen through the cracks, and it gives them a voice. It's your turn to speak up, to stand up and fight back. Welcome to another edition of Speak Up. I'm Kevin Avard, your host. Today I'm joined with a uh, forensic engineer and investigator, uh, Mr. Zed McLaren. Did I say that right? McLaren. McLaren, right. uh, director. And uh, you, you hail from uh, Malden, Mass. Yes. Well, welcome to the show. I'm glad Thanks, to be Kevin. here. Thanks, Kevin. Pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in a forensic engineer and investigator. And expert, wit court and, expert witness. And court expert witness. Uh, that's, that's a mouthful, and I, I really wanted to, to, let's start from the beginning. Uh, what is a forensic engineer? What, where did you get that title? Well, a forensic, uh, a forensic investigator, an expert witness, is somebody who is recognized by the courts as an expert in a field. My current field is uh, judicial and court corruption. Okay. Uh, but I started out a as an... Uh, I, I come from an, a, a musical household. And yeah, we were talking I, about Aerosmith before. Right, right. Mm -hmm. I, I, was, uh, I, 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 I was a rock mus musician, and I went to Wentworth Institute for Electronics, and I put the two, to the two together, and I built the first 16-track audio studio in the world where Aerosmith recorded their first album. Okay. And then after that, I, uh, I, I helped to build the teleconferencing studios at the University of Mass in Boston, out by the Kennedy Library. Okay. Uh, that was the first teleconferencing university in, in the world. Uh, back in those days, the, the scan was so slow that, uh, you know, that you'd get the audio in, but the scan was so slow it would jump every 30 seconds. So the teacher would jump from, you know. But uh, Technology was slow in those days. <laughs> right. Well, it was. But it was the first. That was I, all cutting edge back then. That's right. It was. Uh, uh, these are world class studios, and I helped to build the television studios for uh, New England Deaconess Hospital and for the Beth Israel Hospital. And then, because the, as I was saying earlier, they started having insurance losses in these uh, 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 cutting edge studios, so they recruited. Uh, forensic organizations started recruiting me to come in and help them resolve, you know, how much it's worth, can we, can we reclaim any of this equipment or whatever. So that's how I get involved and then from there, um, I was actually recruited by and taught uh, uh, by a guy who like pioneer, he was a pioneer in the forensic field. Were, were you able to examine whether tapes were doctored or if they were That came later. Spliced? I started off uh, uh, doing insurance losses and then I started working for district attorneys uh, uh, wanting to know if the recordings that they had were actually the coke dealer that they were prosecuting and such like that. So you, you had to legitimize, you know. Yes. Right. Oh yeah, I, I have to follow the scientific method. So when I asked you off camera, you know, you know the people that, that say, hey, there was a UFO in my background. You never right. did that kind of stuff. No, right? I never did that kind okay. of stuff. I just, but, uh, I'm just qualifying <laughs> you, that's all right. Right, I would, uh, I, uh, eventually I became recognized as the first person to prove that, I mean, everybody when they get transcripts or, or uh, court hearing tapes back, they know that something's missing, if there is, you know, if, if they're in a, uh, 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 that kind of a case where corruption is going on. What is the process to determine that? How do you, for instance, okay. uh, we've, we've had cases on, we've had uh, cases on Speak Up where people would say, you know, uh, I think even in the Mike Gill case where he, he, he said, you know, I, I sent my evidence, my, my psych psychological mm -hmm. evidence or mm -hmm. whatever, and it was shredded, it met a flood, and it met a fire. Right. And yet, at the same time, they said that all this stuff happened is the date that the, uh, their attorney, the opposite attorney got the 
information. Right. So how, what is that whole process of you determining whether something has been doctored, uh, you know? Okay. I start off with people who were in the courtroom and were witness to the proceedings. They write affidavits up, and then they come to me, or, or uh, I just don't go willy-nilly looking through tapes to see if there's an edit. I, ha I, I demand that people who are in the courtroom, you know, like the, the, the subject and his witnesses or whatever, okay. like in my case, my, uh, 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 my ex-wife's 15-minute testimony was entirely gone from the hearing tape. Now, they used her testimony to, to get a restraining order against me, but then they took, took her testimony out of the hearing tape because she committed perjury. And they didn't want me to catch now it. How did, how now, that did was the, easy to that that was an easy to remember uh, uh, circumstance. How did you go about? What was the technical so, process? So so you get you get uh, people who are in the courtroom say uh, write up affidavits saying that person testified for about fifteen minutes. This was you know they took notes during the hearing and stuff like that. So it was easy to document. Uh, so then what I do is I get the tape. And I go to that specific place where the uh, uh, witnesses say that something's missing from. And then I blow it up. I have a digital audio workstation where I can blow. Uh, full screen resolution would be one one thousandth of a second. One so I can go really right into the spaces in between words and to see if there's an edit there. So, uh, layman's question here. In courts, don't they have stenographers or? Uh, uh, some, pe some courts have stenog stenographers. Mm -hmm. Other courts have tape recordings, which you then get a copy of and take it to your own uh, uh, transcriptionist to get the transcript. Are we still using tape these days, or are they using digital? Well, I'm proud to say that I've, uh, I've, I've pushed Massachusetts to the point where they're using uh, 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 um, they're still recording stuff, but stuff is on video now. But what they're, it's all a scam because the, the technical way to do it is to have a video recording of every hearing and trial with bur uh, time code burned in in the lower right hand so corner nobody or something can like that. Digitally so if there's, if there's a, an edit, the time code will jump. Are they doing that now? No, they're doing, vi they're doing uh, audio-visual recordings, but they're leaving out the time code, the burned-in time code. What is the process once a, a hearing is over? What, what happens to that tape or that, that uh, it video? Gets, it gets impounded. In, who, who does all that? There's a clerk of courts that's, uh, that's responsible for uh, handling the tapes. Who are they answerable to? Is it the judge? Is I it the... guess it's to the administration of the, uh, of the court. Okay. See, the judges are administrators of the law. Clerks are the keepers of the record. So when a judge orders a clerk to change something, he is acting outside his jurisdiction. Judges are the, are the administrators of the law. They have nothing. That, there's a real separation there. Because he's a state judge, but the court is a county court. Right? So would it be the, the sheriff then? That, that no, no, it would be the, uh, the, the, the chief administrator, the chief clerk of the, uh, of the court and would be responsible for, and for everything, for all the documentation in that court. So when a judge orders a transcriptionist to alter something, mm -hmm. he is committing, and this, this is not me, this is a finding by the U.S. Supreme Court, many, many findings. Crimes against the U.S. government and treason. If a judge asks for something to be altered. It, he is a traitor. Okay. That's, that's me, a very powerful. I know, but I, I qualified it by saying that's, the, uh, that's what the United States Supreme Court has said. Can you cite many, the case? Will versus, uh, U.S. versus Will. U.S. versus Will. Right. Okay. And... Um, I can provide you with more okay. so that you can we'll pass look at it that. on yeah, to I'm, your viewers. I'm looking at the, the technical part of this, and I'm doing it for a reason because, uh, you know, I, I'm a layman when it comes to that, that part of it. And I, I don't know if New Hampshire and Massachusetts are operating on the same level, but I do know that Massachusetts stamps, I believe, they, they, when you go into the clerk's office and say, look, I need 
uh, a restraining order or I need a, a hearing or uh, an ex parte or mm -hmm. something to that effect, it's, it's dated and it's stamped. Date stamped, yes. I don't know if that's done here in New Hampshire. Really? I believe that in New Hampshire they can be cherry picked. I'm, it, it, well, if you don't ask for it to be, uh, <laughs> in, in Massachusetts you can get them uh, uh, with a seal. Okay. That costs like 15 or $20. If it's just a date stamped stamp, it's like 250 And they can give you a copy without doing either one, okay. without having a date stamp on it. But, I mean, it's no good getting something from the court that doesn't have a date stamp or but, a, but the or date a stamp seal on it because then uh, they're guaranteeing that it's an original document. Okay. Uh, and I guess the, what I'm getting at is... is you know, with that date stamp, then there's a trial or there's a, a hearing at such and such a time, right? Be, based upon that date. Whereas in New Hampshire, I think it's at the, at the will of the court when you'll be heard. Oh, really? No, the date stamp is just to uh, just to document when you received that from the clerk. Okay. And then you're able to use it in your proceedings because the clerk has certified with that date stamp or that seal. Uh, uh, that it's a it's a original document. So let's get back to documents that are missing or recordings that are missing. Uh, you, you've actually experienced that in yourself. I mean, here you're in the industry, and all of a sudden you're finding that now you're a victim of the fact that there was information missing in, in one of your hearings. No, the first okay regarding the, the the kidnapping of my son, the first four hearings were all altered. The, the tapes were illegally altered. And you could prove that? I, yes, I proved that with uh, witnesses. I have a, uh, a, a forensic reports that I'm going to be publishing on our website, justiceforfamilies.us website, that uh, uh, have the affidavits from the eyewitnesses. Mm -hmm. Then it shows all the digital printouts showing that this is what a they didn't do any, di well, the, the, back in the 90s, they didn't have any digital, they had a wall and sack recording, uh, recorders. And when you put a cassette recorder into stop, it puts a digital imprint ah. on the tape. Okay. So it, that you it, can start it, from if, right where you, you left right, off. Right, well, it, you know, if you know, you should br bring the record uh, uh, volume down before you hit the stop. But these people didn't know to do that. They just hit the stop. Uh, uh, let the playback tape play the section that they don't want to be on, and then they, they pick it up from after the, uh, after the part that they want to edit out. So it's, 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 a, it's a, I actually predicted uh, uh, what kind of an editing system that the, the court that I was involved with, uh, uh, Middlesex Probate and Family Court in Cambridge, uh, uh, I predicted the type of editing system that they were using and I got a, a, a journalist from the Massachusetts News to come into the courthouse with me. We went up to the clerk's office who took care of the tapes and he was at lunch. We went into his office and took pictures of the exact ty uh, uh, type of editing system that I predicted would be there in, in a forensic report that I had done six months earlier. It, so I predicted how they were doing it right. and I went in and I took pictures of the exact Kind, uh, kind of editing system that they had in the court. Now it's important to note that courts aren't supposed to make copies in their individual court courthouses. They're supposed to send it to Springfield, Mass, and the Springfield uh, court there it, uh, is supposed to do the authentic uh, uh, copies. So recently, recently we had an expert here in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. in, in your state, mm -hmm. no, not here in New Hampshire. Uh, she uh, was Oh my gosh, she was tampering with evidence. She was, right, that the, the DNA evidence and were, I, I forgot her name, uh -huh. uh, but uh, it, it, was, it was in the news recently, just about a woman who was an expert on DNA and... Oh, and she was altering and evidence. And she was altering to, evidence. To, and to now, come up with a... This is really something similar, even though it's not DNA, right. it's the recordings of the court. Right, to... to, to I know where you're going. There's a predetermined output or outcome, predetermined outcome that they want, and they have to alter the record so that the judge's ruling, uh, uh, you know, uh, stands, stands by. Right. Stands. 
uh, the judge tells these clerks what to take out of the court record so that his uh, ruling doesn't uh, and that's provable isn't disqualified by its own by their own records and that's provable that they've been doing this absolutely in fact I've never since 1994 I've never been in a court that didn't illegally alter records if that is provable doesn't don't people have uh, a right for, to appeal if that if they can prove sure. it right well I'm working on a case now down in Maryland where this guy was uh, uh, they planted drugs on him and Oxycontin, or whatever, yeah, the Oxycontin. And uh, they prosecuted him. Uh, he's totally innocent. I have all of his evidence, and I'm his uh, expert witness. But uh, he was one of 1,200 other people that they planted drugs on and prosecuted. They knew all these people were innocent, but they did it for funding. Who, who's they? Prosecutors, judges. How can you Please. prove that? How can you prove that? Well, with, with documentation, uh, 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 you, you have to get eyewitness testimony. You have to get, uh, you know, this, this guy was put in jail and he was tortured trying to get him, force him. He was, he was a, uh, a, a uh, private investigator. And he, before that, he was a Navy SEAL. So this guy has uh, integrity. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I proved that his case uh, was a setup and malicious prosecution for profit, how that's did you, a big concept in America. How did you prove well, that? Well, eyewitness testimony, right? Documentation that he went in weighing he went in weighing uh, uh, what like two eighty or something like that. He lost one hundred and forty seven pounds while he was in the detention center because they withheld his medication and they, uh, they beat him regularly uh, to get him to f uh, sign a plea bargain, which he wouldn't do because he's a man of integrity. And they tried to kill him. Mm. So, and, and he has, he, he brought me proof that 1,200 other people were maliciously prosecuted just like him. Innocent people, they know that they're innocent, but they get money for the prosecution, the court gets money, the police department gets money, uh, they get notoriety. You're talking about racketeering. Yes, I am. Rico. Yes. And are you still being used as an expert witness? Yes. You are? Yes. Okay. Even though you're making these claims. Well, even though I've been dragged from my car and beaten senseless and hospitalized with the threat, if I ever go back to court, I'll never see my son again. I've never seen my son again. So these people are serious. And it goes from your local county court up through state courts. I said, you know, I, 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 uh, when I was in U.S. District Court here in Boston, you know, where the bomber's going to be prosecuted? Mm -hmm. Th that court is a criminal enterprise. I've already proven that. And every, every Department of the uh, Department of Justice, every agency of the Department of Justice has had that proof. Eric Holder has that proof. Barack Obama has that proof. I have the receipts. Now, you know, people, when they hear this, their eyes are going to be rolling. They're going to go, oh, my God, here's another people conspiracy People have theory. been calling me crazy for 15 years, but I'm somehow, even though I'm saying the same words, I, I'm gaining more credibility every, every year who's, as people find out what's really going on. Who's using you as a, as a forensic now? Uh, well, I have cases in, in uh, Arizona where... Uh, I'm dealing with the kid, uh, CPS, Child Protective Services, using false allegations to kidnap children to get federal funds. A RICO scheme. Are you proving any with results? With results. Well, I got uh, Sylvia Huzuris, who was in, in a mental, they put her in a mental institution because she was talking about judicial corruption. I went, I went down there with my cameraman and I, and I went up against dozens of judges who had ruled on her case and said that she's never going to get out of the mental institution until she stops talking about judicial corruption. Well, three days after I took her case and I went, I had, for three years I'd written motions for her that went no place. I made a grand jury presentation and three days after I went to the grand jury she was released, even though judges were saying she was never going to get out until she stopped talking about judicial corruption. Well, she's out, 
and she's still talking about judicial corruption. L let me ask you about the state of Massachusetts. Do you have a redress of grievance committee? No, we don't. Okay, so there is no place in Massachusetts where you can go and get justice for uh, regarding judicial corruption. So if you find that, okay, here I'm going to paint a scenario. If the judge and your lawyer and the opposing lawyer are all friends, yep, and they play golf mm -hmm. or they vacation together, right, or they're part of the same lodge or group or function, and they don't recuse themselves in the case, you obviously see that there's a conflict of interest. You tend, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now you don't know this, and your lawyer right. is saying, look, we're going to ask for an extension, right. uh, we're going to plea bargain, we're going to do something, and, uh, and over and over until basically after they find out how much in your, your financial affidavit you can afford, mm -hmm. uh, your bled dry, and then you find out uh, that you've received no justice. Right. Uh, and then all of a sudden, a little light bulb goes off saying, wait a minute, I've just, I just been rooked. Where do I go? Wait a second. This judge and these judges are all friends, and if, you, if these lawyers want to gain any ground in their court, they have to play by the rules, and if they upset any of the judges, then none of my clients will be able to get any justice in this court. So now I just see a no-win situation in the court system. I'm going to go to my legislator. I'm going to go to my legislator, and my legislator is going to say, what do you want me to do about it? Uh, well, they usually use the bogus excuse that they can't get involved in a judicial matter. Because of the separation of power. So now, what I'm trying to point out is a scenario. But I thought the, the branches of government were supposed to balance each other out. Correct. Exactly. <laughs> they, they, they are supposed, They're supposed to, but, but they what don't. I'm trying to, the, the whole point of my scenario is this. Now, here you have an individual who has been beaten by the judicial system, right. can't go to the legislative because there isn't a formal committee where they can say, I need to air a grievance. Right. First Amendment. Yes. They have a right to petition Absolutely. their government. Right. Now, there was a formal uh, committee here in New Hampshire. It was called the Redress of Grievance Committee. And the, the new uh, powers to be, if you will, uh, have decided in their wisdom to get rid of it. But I sat on that committee as a state rep. I know. And Well, that's why I'm here tonight, right. because I, I want to encourage grievance committees and grand juries and, and places where people can go to get justice. Well, what I'm, the, the whole point I'm trying to get at is there isn't a mechanism in, New, in, in Massachusetts where there's a formal committee for people to file a petition with their government to, to say, hey, look, I'm being injured by my, my, my government. The same thing now where we used to have in New Hampshire is gone. Right. And I'm not trying to give myself a super plug, but I'm going to give a plug right here. Sure. Because of that, I created uh, the Redress of Grievance LLC in a private organization to do exactly what we were doing in committee mm -hmm. where people can come to an organization, air their grievance, show their documentation. If you make a claim, you have to show the affidavit. Absolutely. The, the, the laws that have been violated, mm -hmm. it gets vetted. Yes. You find either a legislative or a legal procedure to go forward. Mm -hmm. Present it then to a legislative body mm -hmm. after it's been vetted. Right. So that it can go before committee. In New Hampshire, if you file a bill, it has to be heard. Right. It has to go, to, I don't know how that works in Massachusetts. Well, I had a bill of address against uh, uh, Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Court, Margaret Marshall. Now, she's the judge that created gay marriage, the concept of gay marriage. And in my case, they, they took up, the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts took up my case, uh, uh, my son's case, to the, the kidnapping of my son's case, to uh, rewrite a law. Le in other words, they legislated from the bench, uh, which is treason, the gay marriage law, and they legislated from the bench. You're going to have to explain that, okay? Well, exactly, go ahead. Well, judges can't make law. Only the legislature can make laws, right. but 
uh, uh, the gay marriage law, as it's now known, isn't really a law. It's a, it's a ruling by judges. Didn't, didn't, wait a second, didn't Massachusetts vote for, for gay marriage? No. Oh, I thought I thought They that weren't was... allowed to vote. Oh, I thought that that's, was... That's, that, that's, the, uh, that's the bugaboo. About, and, and now the, uh, uh, the uh, Prop 8 uh, uh, of California is before the Supreme Court, and they're trying to uh, uh, jump over the fact that the, the voters voted in favor of uh, doing away with gay marriage. So they want to jump over the voters mm -hmm. and, and legislate from the bench how you know, it's going to be. You know, that's interesting. A, a, a number of years back, there was a, 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 something that was put on the ballot here in New Hampshire, and it had to do with uh, uh, Article 83A. And basically, what it, what it said is uh, that the Supreme Court justices shall have the, the administrative rule over the courts. Well, that's kind of a no-brainer. That kind of made sense, you mm -hmm. know? So they put that on the ballot. What was missing on the ballot in New Hampshire for the people not to see was the last line, which was, such promulgated rules shall have the effect of, of law. law. Right. So <laughs> when a judge makes a rule, it has the effect of law. Now this is where, this is where it gets really pretty. So now judges can make rules that have the effect of law that have nobody to input. The people cannot counter it. Right. They can't ask their legislator because there's a separation of powers, so to speak. And so what they've done is they've insulated themselves from the people. Right. And guess what? Then all the state departments had, yeah, that's a great idea. If the judges can do it, maybe we can do it. Mm -hmm. So the Department of Education can make a rule that has effect of law. Right. The Department of Justice, it just goes well, on and on. It's a conspiracy in as much as they all know it's not a law but they all defer to that rule. Exactly. Now here's my the argument, effect. here's my argument that no lawyer, well I, I haven't met the lawyer who will actually make this argument, that you can't use local rules to violate your constitutional rights. <laughs> it's very, you have to go a long way to find a lawyer who will argue that for you because they're in the system and they're part of these, well, the federal rules of civil procedure, the federal rules of criminal procedure, right? Mm -hmm. They were written by the judges and lawyers for the judges and lawyers. And the, the scam is, is that they no longer uh, uh, write their citations uh, uh, pursuant to laws. It's pursuant to the federal rules of civil procedure that they wrote. It's judicial fiat. It doesn't exist in the law. And the only place where judicial immunity exists is in the rules of civil procedure. It's not a law. Um, Judges don't have immunity. They've, writ they've written themselves their own immunity, just like you're giving an example of uh, here in New Hampshire. They're writing their own rules. Zed, how can people get in touch with you? At uh, uh, my website is www.justiceforfamilies.us, and the other one is uh, Forensic Engineers. At, um, what is it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's Forensic Engineers and Investigators, FEI. It's, and it's, it's, on, uh, it's on the uh, internet. Um, okay. FEI, and that, that is on the internet. It's yeah. Z. Dot MC. Zed, yeah, Z Z E D dot M C at Verizon dot net. All right. Do you mind giving out your phone number or no? No, not oh. at all. Seven eight one three two four one nine eight nine. Okay. Well, we're going to close out this segment, and we're going to have you back on to talk a little bit more specific about a couple of other cases, if sure. that's okay. Yes. And I just wanted to give uh, our viewers uh, an introduction to who you are. And maybe look, you know, do their own Google search. On, uh, and well, there's another resource. I do forensic videos. Okay. Where uh, where I put my cases. Uh, I I do a video. Like I said, I went down to Maryland to get Sylvia out of the mental institution. Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, I I make a forensic video and then I post the evidence, the documentation on the website on okay. the Justice for Families website, and that way. Your viewers can look at the video and then uh, uh, decide for themselves. Go to the go to the website. Actually, go through the doctors' reports. Go through the police reports. They can see for themselves the evidence. That's why I call it forensic videos. Right. And you can find those at uh, YouTube www.youtube.com/slash/forensicz. 
Okay. Now, the reason I want to do this is I want, I want our viewers to get a chance to investigate you and look at what you, what you do and, and sure. build so that your credibility will be there so that the next time we come back on, I, I want to follow up and I want to talk specifically about uh, the case with your son. Okay. And, yes. and, and we'll go from there and we'll, that'll be in our, maybe the following week if, if that's okay. Okay. And we'll, we'll put that out there. But uh, this gives the people an opportunity to look at you with, with, under a my, microscope. That's fine. And, and because if you, no problems with that? No, is great. I have no problems with that. As you've seen television where expert witness go up, get up on the stand, they say, well, in my opinion, right. well, I never say that. I say fact A plus fact B equals this result. Okay. I, I defer to the facts. I let the I gather evidence and I present my reports in such a way that the facts do the talking. Okay. And that way my ego, me, I'm not even in there. You can just take it yourself and, and judge for yourself. Okay. Well, thank you for watching this episode of Speak Up. Um, if you want to become a sponsor of this show or you want to get in touch with us, uh, email me at speakupnh at gmail.com or send me a letter at P.O. Box 207, National, New Hampshire, 03061. And thank you for watching this show, and uh, we'll be back next week. Every day, citizens around the country are faced with new dilemmas. Dilemmas that affect them profoundly. Whether it's injustice, discrimination, falling through the cracks, scandals and cronyism, balances of power, ethics, religious freedom, state versus citizens, and unfunded mandates, and the list goes on and on and on. Welcome to Speak Up. It's directed at those who have fallen through the cracks, and it gives them a voice. It's your turn to speak up, to stand up and fight back.